These videos are made possible thanks to the generous support of my patrons, such as Chris Kitsune Campbell, who was my first new patron in November. Thanks, Chris! Hello, spicy people of the internet! Spice 8 Rack here, aka a gay pirate, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, with me, with me today, we've got a little bit of a treat. It's my, it's my good friend of the, of me and the channel. It's Amanda Stevens. Say hello, Amanda Stevens. Hi, everyone. Remember, Simic is underpowered, and Oko did nothing wrong. We're not, we're not bringing that evil back onto this <laughs> channel. How dare you! I was going to introduce you as um, Simic apologist and elf lover Amanda Stevens, and I decided not to at the kindness of my heart, and you threw it back in my face. Look, I I was looking at the comment section of our last video, and uh, somebody who had like commented recently was like, "Oh man, you know, Amanda was asking for where's the green board wipe? Well, that aged poorly." And I was like, "Right, they did give us the mass fight card. That's essentially a green board wipe." But you know, we still don't have the green counter spell, so um... We do have green counter spells! <laughs> we have Autumn's Veil, we have Guttural Response, we have green counter magic. We're not, we're not dwelling on this bit any longer, we have important things to discuss. Oh, what are we discussing today, Spice? Today we're going to be talking about blackness in Magic the Gathering, we're talking about it as representation, uh, talking as well about representation as uh, as a tool, um, uh, its use, its benefits, its politics and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to kick off the conversation. So uh, really, Amanda, where is a good place to start when it comes to talking about blackness in Magic within the game? I think a, a great place to start is probably the blackest set Magic has ever had, or I guess block, right? Because this was back in the old days where there were blocks in Magic the Gathering, uh, would be the Mirage block. So for those of you who do not know, or maybe don't particularly remember, or weren't playing this this long in Magic the Gathering, back in 1996, uh, Wizards of the Coast released the Mirage block. And this took place on the continent of Jumora, on the plain of Dominaria, where a lot of the original Magic sets take place. Uh, and Jumora is essentially West Africa. Mm. Uh, it's like a mostly desert uh, continent. Off to the on its west coast is where like most of the vegetation uh, and a lot of its like more populated areas are. Uh, for those of you who may have heard of this little planeswalker who's behind me, uh, Teferi, he's from Zalfir, which is on the continent of Jumora. Um, and so the the lore of this set is that. Jumora was not affected by the Silex Blast uh, from the Brothers' War because it's so far to the south. Uh, so while Ice Age is happening, you know that that all of that nonsense block is going on. We we get we take a little break. We go on a tropical vacation, uh, except some demons are up to some no good, and uh, Teferi gets himself lost in a, a time bubble, you know, recurring problem of his, and uh, <laughs> some heroes of Jumora. Uh, have to rise up to uh, stop the continent from basically falling over uh, under the control of this demon. Mm. Uh, and that is sort of the very brief overview of the Mirage block. But uh, because Jamora is this sort of West Africa allegory in Dominaria, a lot of the card art features a lot of darker skinned individuals and not like racially ambiguously darker skin. Uh, I don't like to say, like, oh, they, their look of African descent because that, you know, I don't want to say, like, they're black because not everyone from Africa is black. But, you know, what you would expect for the racial makeup of North Africa is what you get out of Jamora. So a lot of people of, like, uh, more descent, uh, you know, some Muslim uh, representation. Uh, I would say that the Skada are probably the closest to, like, uh, more of, like, a Persian uh, influence because they are the merchants of the Jamar continent, and that's what we think of when we think of the Persians. Um, but yeah, it's like a very black set. Like, all of the clothing is very African-inspired. Uh, a lot of the architecture that we get to see is very African-inspired. There's a lot of cultural references in the set. A lot of the main characters are black. There's very few white characters in the set. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's like what I would say kind of is like the peak of, of black representation in magic. We have your hand up. I do, I do want to interrupt your flow. Something that has uh, uh, occurred to me as you were sort of describing the set, it feels very much like the magic allegory for 
whilst you have all of this sort of like the cold snap, the ice age that happened after Urza Silex blast and you sort of smash cut to this continent which is experiencing golden age of sort of like technology and commerce and stuff yeah. like that. It feels very much like the contrast within sort of like our real world history of like the European Dark Age. We refer to that period in time as the Dark Ages, despite the fact it was only really sort of like the central European continent Just that Europe. was going through that. Um, like compared that to the sort of like uh, uh, Arabian North and North African sort of like golden age, you know. Yeah, uh, another great allegory for or metaphor or analogy, whatever you want to use for uh, what's going on in Jamora is uh, if those of you who like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you probably heard of the small, insignificant uh, African nation known as Wakanda. Uh, and that's ex that's essentially what Zalfir is for Dominaria. So Zalfir, because it wasn't affected by the Silex Blast, still has is you know co consistently ramping up its military might, its its research. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, we think of like Benalia as like you know probably one of the more militaristic nations of Dominaria. Uh, well, Zalfir like surpasses them by far. Because Benalia, over the course of Dominaria, has had a lot of hard resets. Mm. And because of where Jamora is, uh, it doesn't really get caught up in a lot of the Dominaria conflicts consistently. Like the plane span, uh, spanning ones. It is involved in some conflicts, but not like the multi-plane battles Jamora kind of ducks out of. Uh, also, Sulfur is known for being very magic advanced. Uh, they understood color theory way before any of the other regions of Dominaria. Uh, they uh, they have their own guilds, and each guild is represented, uh, is uh, sort of focused on a specific color of magic. Oh. Um, yeah, just technologically, like, those of you probably have heard of, like, mana rigs. Uh, that's technology that was created by, uh, I guess, co-created, but created by Zalfir. Urza had a little bit of a hand in it. Um, but yeah, we have, like, if you're thinking, if you, like, want to know the best way to think of Zalfir, uh, which is important to, like, how we'll talk about blackness and magic going forward, uh, just think Wakanda. I think it is it is very interesting, like, hearing all of this information about and the stuff that I didn't know about this area of Dominaria. It makes me kind of sad that pretty much since we've, like, since Time Spiral Block and all the, you know, the mending and stuff like that that's happened, each time we've gone back to Dominaria, it's just been dominaria like the whole plane as opposed to specific sections of it specific continents and stuff like that because this is fascinating yeah and i think that that's one of the things that when we were prepping for this episode and you were kind of asking and i'm i'm a very light vorthos folks mm. uh i was very into magic at uh in like middle school and for me that meant like marcadian masks and invasion block um and so like i read those novels so like Unlike a lot of, like, I'm not, like, a dedicated Vorthos where I read all of the lore consistently and I, like, stay up to date. I'm just a hyper-specialist. I would like to point out that I was, like, uh, four or five um, whilst when those blocks came out. Just want to point, point that out. It's okay. If you want to call me old, you know, we can go back to calling you a gay pirate. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I called myself. I took that joke away from you and made it my own. You, you gay cat pirate. Meow. All right. Continue. <laughs> please, um, please continue. But, you know, one of the things I think is interesting is that with the exception of, I guess, Odyssey, which kind of takes place uh, specifically on one island of um, Dominaria, a lot of magic sets, if they're on Dominaria, are on Dominaria, right? They are on the whole of Dominaria. And except for, like, mm. four sets, Mirage being part of that, of that categorization... There's not a lot of hyper focus. And when you look at a lot of magic storytelling, you kind of get that feel too. Like Ixalan takes place essentially like all of Ixalan, right? Zendikar takes place all over. It's like, you know, a great adventure. Uh, same thing with like Innistrad, Ravnica, right? Like all of these other sets tell the story of the plane as a whole, except uh, Dominaria. Dominaria is a very much, very randomly every now and then is like, oh, what if we just told a story on like this one specific area? Um, mm. So we had this really great time in, in, in Mirage Block where we get a lot of blackness and magic. And then uh, Mirage Block ends. We go back in time and uh, we do the Urza set, the Urza Block, where we go back in the timeline a bit to like learn more about Urza and Teferi and Joira and the Tolarian Academy. Not to be confused with the Tolarian Community College. 
And then, uh, you know, then we kind of, like, leave Dominaria for a bit, if I'm not mistaken. But, like, uh, after Mirage, black depictions on magic cards kind of tanks. Mm. Real bad. Uh, you know, as like a as as like a huge fan of Magic, and who also happens to be Black O'Clock, um, <laughs> you know, I, it's a thing that I would notice as a kid that like, and I, I was like kind of used to this in media in general, which is like why I was like super excited for like Power Rangers to have like Zack, um, why I was like really hyped for like a show like Static Shock, uh, why I was really happy that the Justice League show used Jon Stewart instead of Hal Jordan. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I pick up on where the black representation is, even if it's not, like, a thing that I cognizantly, like, was thinking about, right? Like, oh, there's so little of it, it was more like, oh, shit, there's a black guy on this show. Um, you know, it's the same thing for Magic. You know, I would be looking at cards ad nauseum, and then I'd be like, oh, shit, there's a black guy on this card. Lit. Mm. Uh, and there just, like, wasn't a lot of black people on Magic cards. And, you know, Spice kind of asked me, you know, when did I think sort of the drought ended and i would say that like consistent depictions of black people on magic cards where it's not just like three or four cards a set or you know some sets only have like one would be dominaria so there's like a 20 there's like a 20 year gap between i would say mirage and dominaria where you didn't have to be a face character to be a black character on a magic card mm. uh because like People are gonna be like, whoa, there, you know, there's this black legendary creature, that black legendary creature. It's like, yeah, legendary creature. But then, like, how many cards just have like incidental white people on it? Mm. So, yeah, white as default in terms of like crowd shots and stuff like that. Yeah, and so like where you start to see consistently more black people in Magic Art, I would say is Dominaria. Like there are other sets. I know a lot of people are gonna be like, well, oh, didn't we have like the Egypt set Amonkhet? Go, go look at the Amonkhet art and just like scroll through it and then tell me how many like what you consider to be the average african african skin tone to be and tell me how much of that is like actually on amonkhet art like first of all a lot of the amonkhet like legendaries are the gods and like a, a bunch of very white presenting egyptian folks which historically yes they're egypt is a more fair-skinned region of africa uh but like there's a difference between being fair skinned and like white presenting and i would say that like amonkhet definitely shades closer to the uh white presenting mm. side of card art i already know i'm setting myself up for some real fun comments right now well, no i, th but, I think uh, no it's it is an interesting thing to to talk about as well because there is blackness is so much more than just a visual and so like trying to trying to discern when someone is white presenting or white as a like a character within like a video game with a uh, within a um, card game. Magic is particularly difficult because the like you're literally going off of maybe one or two pictures drawn, oftentimes by completely different artists. Oh yeah, I mean like we you brought this up. Um, you know, this is kind of like the consistent joke that a lot of people talk about Chandra because Chandra is supposed to be from Kaladesh, mm. and uh, Sh Chandra is supposed to be, I believe it's like Indian descent. Yes. Like that's yes. what. But, like, look at Chandra and tell me that she's consistently drawn to look Indian. Mm. Or, like, another great example would be Sisse. Sisse is one of the most racially ambiguous characters who is from Zulfir. Like, she, she's from the Dramora continent. She's from Zulfir. In her very initial magic art, she's, like, kind of dark-skinned. But then, like, after that, you, like, look at some Sisse cards and you, like, would not be able to tell mm. that she's supposed to be black. Mm. Or at least, like, we'll say North African, right? Like, maybe she's supposed to be, like, Persian descent. She's supposed to be, like, black-brown. But if you look at some of her card arts, it is wildly inconsistent. I seem to remember Gideon was, like... I think revealed to be from Theros and then his art that came out afterwards tended to paint him obviously in a more Mediterranean capacity than how he used yeah, to be. Yeah, like his original, like his original card art, he's like very white presenting. Mm. And then he gets progressively whiter. Mm. And then they're like, oh, he's from Theros. And then all of a sudden he has an olive complexion and you're like, did somebody... 
Did somebody rem did somebody go, oh crap, we said he's from Theros. I guess he has to look Mediterranean now. Um, I mean, so you know what? Let's before we like leave this topic of Mirage, I kinda wanna uh, you know, this is something I've become kind of known about lately, uh, from my Commander Herald article and, you know, some of my other appearances. Plug, 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 plug. Plugs. Plugs. Um, is uh I wanna stop for a moment and sort of address something that I haven't really addressed on Twitter, uh, because I just didn't want to get involved with a bunch of people in comments is a uh, in Mirage Walk is probably one of my favorite TM magic cards of all time, which is reparations. Uh, for those of you unaware reparations and maybe through the power of editing a, re a reparations will end up on the screen. So reparations is an enchantment from Mirage Walk that is one white blue. And it says whenever a creature of your a creature you control is uh, targeted by a spell or ability your opponent controls, draw a card. Cool. Name, card ability, they sync up. Not an issue. The issue comes in two parts. The card art and the flavor text. And the card art, there is this like white guy with blonde hair and like what looks like traditional like uh, Christian monk robes. Uh, there is a treasure chest overflowing with gold. There is a very solemn looking black couple. And in the background, you can see a built a village, uh, either a on fire or B having recently been on fire because there's like smoke billowing, uh, in the skyline and the flavor text written by, uh, Mark Rosewater is sorry. I burnt down your village. Here's some gold. Uh, and when we're kind of talking about magic, uh, and racism and magic and blackness, I think reparations is a very interesting card. A lot of people have told me, well, oh, you missed the joke. And to which I say, what's the punchline? Cause like if the punchline is, oh, a village got burnt down and a guy is giving them gold for it. That's not really a joke so much as like slightly humorous, maybe. Uh, but not actually like when you really like try to break down a card like reparations You have to look at like who are the actors in it one. I just told you that Mirage set is Vastly black like vastly North African. There are very few white people on the continent let alone in card art and here we have a white dude <laughs> giving a black village gold as I said in my article it, it would have made a lot more sense if it was like Sukada um, merchants giving like Viashino gold, right? Like that fits more of the flavor or even just a black person giving other black people gold for burning down a village. That's where I think you can have sort of the interesting commentary uh, and, and sort of like, then I think the joke of the flavor text or the, uh, I believe a lot of people said, you know, sarcasm or irony or satire, satire is the word. A lot of people was like, oh, the, 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 the flavor text is satire. It's like, is it, is it really satire if that's like actually what happens, right? Like how is it satire if like, that's the mindset that Western colonial people had, like, how is that satire? I don't want to dwell on operations too much because if you've seen me on like a YouTube video or podcast, I've talked about this card a lot because I think when you talk about blackness and magic, you kind of can't ignore cards like this and disruptive student. Um, which is the other card that I harp on a lot, which is a very poorly drawn depiction of teen Teferi, where he's like hunched over and kind of looks kind of gremlin like, and he's got the Cro Magnum skull, and it's just really bad, even for like old magic art quality. Like, because there's some old magic cards where you look at the art, and even if it's not the like cartoonish art, like recycle, uh, you're like, oh, this is like not super well drawn. And you're like, oh, you chalk it up to like 90s fantasy art. And that's like sort of the excuse. But like the, the fairy art's like above and beyond, like really bad. Uh, and it, even if you want to say, because you know, somebody with their with their whole chest was like, well, some races have different skull shapes. And I was like, way to say you're Woo! a white nationalist out loud without saying you're a white nationalist. Holy fucking um, shit. Did they fucking <laughs> like punctuate that with a pair of calippers? Jesus Christ. Yeah, so, um, like, it, th I, I just, like, can't talk about Blackness and Magic without ever bringing up these two cards. Uh, one is just, like, not ironic. I don't really find it super funny. I think it's just, like, very tone deaf. Um, and when Watsy, you know, decided to ban, what was it, like, nine cards randomly, 
only one of them I thought was like a good band and that was Evoke Prejudice because even as a kid I remember looking at the Magic Encyclopedia and seeing a card like I remember looking through it and seeing a Invoke Prejudice and going that's just a clans meeting why is that on a Magic card I think Magic needs to talk a bit Watson needs to look a little bit deeper as they're currently kind of doing with D&D about some of their more subtle racist aspects and I think reparations is like part of that conversation the same thing with Destructive Student moving on it's kind of funny that you brought up the gate watch because another thing that used to come up a lot uh especially with blackness in media is that you know black people sometimes have to claim characters that aren't black uh for representation matters you know like there's like the joke uh in the black anime community that like we claimed piccolo like piccolo is ours fuck mr popo that that's racist but we, we definitely take Piccolo. And, you know, there was a conversation a lot of people would say about, like, you know, when someone would say there's there's not a black planeswalker, people would point to uh, our good obsidian friend, uh, Koth. People would go, oh, well, Koth is black. And I'd be like, Koth is black? Are, are we sure? Isn't he a stone person? Isn't he, isn't he not a human? Mechanically, the Volshock people of Mirrodin are human they have the human type however at what point does like obviously you're quite right like literally made of stone at what point can you make that distinction and i also think it kind of like harkens back to a, a point that i made in the in our previous video of like the aetherborn right mm. when you know when people said like oh the aetherborn are non-binary and i was like well i thought uh and you know i've heard back and forth comments on this the Aetherborn just don't have a concept of gender and sex. Mm. And so, like, is that, like, are, is our non-binary representation really going to come, like, five steps removed from, like, the average conversation of non-binary representation? Mm. Where it's, it comes from uh, a species or, I, I guess, species because they're, they're, fam they're, like, space vampires. Yeah, smoke vampires. We'll go with that. It's like, well, is our non-binary representation going to come from, like, space vampires who don't believe in the concept of sex mm. right like that that's our that's our representation it's like oh so our black our black planeswalker is is a stone man i wonder i wonder if there's some things that are being said here like oh skin like soot huh mm. that might be a little awkward mm. Mm. uh so like that that's kind of like my issue with like saying that the volshock even if they have the human subtype and i think that they're like as close to like human human as like mirrored in uh, uh manufactured plane gets but at the same time, it's like, there's a lot of problematic things if you're going to say that a, a, a black stone man is black. Mm. And by black stone, I mean literal black stone, not black, comma, stone man. Mm. There's a lot of things that I think about when I think about cough as like black representation. And if you're a black person and you're like, yo, I identify with cough, I, I think he's black, that's lit. And I'm never going to tell another black person that they can identify with or claim a character. I am saying that for those of you who may not be black, that maybe you need to think about why you consider Koth to be black. Hmm. Because the Volshock widely aren't depicted as black. Hmm. And Koth is definitely uh, depicted very much more elemental than human. And so we, and then like, to also be fair, we have three black planeswalkers. We have Amamantu. Yep. We have Teferi. Yep. And we have Kaya. We also, we do have Samut. Oh, right. Because Amonkhet talks. Yeah. Samut was like the only black legendary creature yeah. <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> I forgot about Samut. Uh, so yeah, Samut. We have Samut, uh, who I think is still alive after the, the planeswalker war. Yep. Because only, uh, only like three fucking people died, apparently. Oy. Narrative. Sorry. Yeah. Continue. Uh, so in our original recording, uh, Spice 8 Rack and myself kind of forgot to bring up Vivian. And uh, I think that sums up a lot of Vivian as far as her impact on the magic story and sort of her lasting impact on me as, uh, I guess, a black fan of magic. Um, I remember when Vivian first came to the scene, obviously her Planeswalker card was very good, but she felt like, I don't know, how do you say this? Uh, kind of like a deus ex machina. They were like, oh, hey, we introduced this character who has a weapon specifically to fight the big bad, aka Nicol Bolas. And her weapon, the arc bow, you know, 
between that and the Black Blade Reforged, we're going to win the fight. The Arcbow, as far as I remember, didn't really amount to a whole lot. And the Black Blade Reforged was, again, not useful either. Um, and so Vivian has just kind of been this side character. Like, she was on Ikoria, where she didn't really do a whole lot. She's there... And she tries to teach people that, you know, the monsters are their friends and not their enemies. That, you know, you can be pals with animals. She's there when, like, Luca gains his spark and planes walks away. And it's kind of the same story for New Capenna. She's there. We don't know how she ends up there or why she's there. Uh, she is disgusted by the fact that pretty much all of the plant life on New Capenna is artificial. She ends up... Uh, meeting Tezzeret, who's like, hey, I'm here to work for this Phyrexian named Urbras. She goes and follows him. But Vivian as a character is relatively non-impactful to the story. And it's kind of the a thing that, you know, we talk about on the episode, that there are all of these planeswalkers, and a lot of them are black, um, and they don't they don't really do a whole lot outside of Kaya and Teferi. She kind of falls in the same category of a, a decent chunk of black characters in Magic that are there and they're cool, but they don't do a whole lot and they don't matter that much outside of their, you know, specific set. And yes, Vivian has been in multiple sets, uh, corsets, uh, Coria, War of the Spark, but she doesn't really do a whole lot. And, you know, sure, I'm, like, oversimplifying some of her story. But it, it just seems like she was a planeswalker created to introduce the Arcbow. And then they decided not to kill her. And now we're kind of just stuck with her kind of meandering and not really being a part of the story. And I really hope that now that she's been recruited by the Gatewatch for the War of the Phyrexians, that maybe she'll actually have more impact on the story. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that have a theory that Teferi's going to die in the War of the, uh, against the Phyrexians, and maybe this is a way of, like, passing the torch to Vivian so that she could be, you know, more impactful in the story, um, and sort of uh, become one of the new more pertinent planeswalkers but currently she's just not really part of the story um i will use vivian and i i'm not 100 I, I will say this about vivian is that i do like that she's different than kaya and teferi right you know if, if teferi is the mystical negro and kaya is sort of like the black girl magic you know bad bitch type of thing vivian is kind of her own character and is very very green in the sense of like the color pie, right? She's very much about nature and making friends with animals. Um, and she's not, you know, similar to Teferi or Kaya at all. And I do appreciate that. But just as a character, her design isn't doesn't really inspire a lot to me. But otherwise, yeah, Vivian. Not really an exciting character, doesn't really do a whole lot, and kind of falls into the same character of Amamatu, of like, here's a really cool character and a really cool concept, and we're just not going to use her very much. So we have Samut, we have we have Teferi, we have Kaya, and we have Amamatu. Mm -hmm. uh, and we only really see two of them. Teferi, I don't think, I think there's been like, not many sets that Teferi hasn't been in. I was kind of surprised that the Mystical Negro wasn't at Magic College. Um... I was also kind of surprised that Amamantu wasn't at Magic College, but hey, whatever. Um, but, like, Kaya and Teferi are, like, in almost every set now. In yes. some capacity, whether it's the story or or the cards or both. Mm. Um, and then we have Samut, who we got, like, a lot of in, like, a very intense period. Because we got, we got her as a legendary creature, we got her as a planeswalker, and we got her as another planeswalker. So, like, we got a lot of her in, like, a very small period of time. Mm. And then, boom, she's gone. Yeah, I, we have not seen Hyde or Hair of her. And then, and then we got one Amamantu. And so, like, representation for Planeswalkers, even if you say... And so, I, I, I'm imagining the counterpoints already when it comes to black representation, is that, oh, well, there's not a lot of white Planeswalkers. Like, when you really break it down, there's, like, a lot of, like, non-human Planeswalkers and yada, yada, yada. But when you, like, count up the white Planeswalkers... 
and like the myriad of cards that they have, and then you count up the Black Planeswalkers and their iterations on cards, we still lose. Because there's only four of them. There are only two Samet cards, one Amamantu, I think like four Kaya cards, and probably like six or seven Teferis. There's definitely more Chandras than there are Kaya, Amamantu, and Samet put together. And then there's still, there's still racially ambiguous, uh, well, because, you know, people are going to say Chandra's, you know, supposed to be Middle Eastern. I I'll agree when, like, her art's consistent. Uh -huh. And then we have Gideon. Uh, we had Gideon, thank you very much, had, past tense. Oh, dead, right, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then we have, like, Garrick, right, who's definitely very white. Mm -hmm. And he, he outnumbers, I think, almost... Through, like those three minus Teferi mm. put together as well. I was just going to say one thing. I've one thing I've noticed as you're talking about this is that, like three of the three of the four black planeswalkers that we have. So like, and you know, the narrative of magic planeswalkers are the central characters at this point. It, there's no denying that. So of those four uh, planeswalker characters, three of them have been introduced into the story in like the last a bare minimum, like in the last six years, let's say. Three, the majority of like black central characters and you know Aminatu is has as you said we've seen hide nor hair of her um she was on the yeah, promotion she's literally just in a commander deck. yeah and on the promotional material of double masters but didn't even get alternative art whatever but so like in the last six years the majority of central characters have been printed have been made have been released exist and then you look back on like you know the very inception of planeswalkers that was back in like 2000 and what was 2000 um and uh eight so lorwin was 2007 and i think that that's that's where the lorwin it's the lorwin five so we're so if we're looking at planeswalkers right like we're not looking at the we're not looking at this expansive magic history we're just looking at Planeswalkers specifically. Planeswalkers have been around since 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are now, what, 2022? So 15 years of Planeswalkers. And there are only four black Planeswalker characters mm -hmm. in 15 years. Yeah. And of those four, only two are consistently sort of within the narrative. It says something it just a little bit it does say something it says something to the fact that like obviously a shift has happened uh quite recently within magic's doubt of like oh we actually do need to put a little bit of legwork into making sure we're representing black people within our narrative yeah and so like one of the things that i i say a lot is that when people ask me why does representation matter you know this kind of came up with the with the trans representation in magic mm. it comes up a lot when i bring these things up it's easy to like have that question when you're white uh, because you, you see yourself everywhere and you don't have to just latch yourself on to like the first white character that you see because like most of the times there are multitudes of white characters. And so a white character is never a white character. You know, he's the nerd or the goth or, you know, the brazen detective, right? Like you're, you're, you don't have to like watch a cop show, right? You know, a cab, but let's just use a cop show for example. Yeah. Um, when you watch Law and Order SVU, as I do, as you do, I mean, doesn't everyone? Yeah, I've I've got it on right now in the background. <laughs> right, when you watch it, you don't have to be like, well, oh, I'm a guy, but there's only Olivia Benson, so like, I guess I have to like see myself through Olivia Benson. No, there's a bunch of white characters on that show. Mm. There, there's only one, there's only one Ice T, right? Like, there's only one black character on on SVU. So if you want to see yourself. Even just racially, you, you you're you're stuck with just that one character. Mm. When it comes to like magic, and you're like reading the lore, you're like looking through the card arts or whatever, and you don't see yourself there. There feels that sort of sense of exclusion, mm. whether it's like intentional or not. Mm. One of my biggest complaints about the show Friends is that it takes place in New York City and everyone's white. Mm -hmm. And if you like actually go to New York City, that that's like not true. There's a lot of complaints I have about Friends, but that's like the big one. Mm. Is that like they go to a coffee shop. And there's all these other scenes, and they take place in New York City, and there's never a black person. I'm like, what, what, like weird version of New York City are you, are you in? Mm. Um, and so when you feel that you don't see yourself in any of the of like any of Magic, because you're not on the cards, you you're not you're not in the key art, you're not in a a lot of it. It doesn't feel great. Mm. And sure, 
you know, there's more to people than their race, right? Like, I'm more than just, you know, a black person. Spice is more than just a white person. You know, we're multifaceted uh, people. But I still want to see other black people. Mm. Right? And so, like, when you only have two characters that are consistently in Magic Story that are black, mm. because, like, let's be real, it's cool that, like, there's a bunch of legendary creatures, but then when you actually read the story, they're, like, barely in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, like you, like you read, like you read, like any of the story, and you're like, oh yeah, this guy was like in one part of the story because he's a legendary creature. Yeah, I think like th there's something that jumps to mind as you're saying that is like Queen Queen Linden from Eldraine, who is like yeah. all of like the story tidbits that were being sort of passed out on the mothership and like in flavor text and stuff like that. She's this badass queen. She's uh uh like raising. Uh, these kids that uh, their mother died and she stepped in and she's like doing the best that she can whilst also running the uh, helping to run the entire plane pretty much the monarchy of the plane yeah you know, fuck queens and kings but you know in fancy stories yeah. whatever but like when you actually read the story the actual book itself she's in it right at the beginning and then comes swoops in right at the end to like dump a bunch of exposition on you and then and then it's over like the entire narrative of the um the wildred quest is literally following the two um the two twins. twins yeah the two twins as they fuck about in the woods or whatever like that's like she doesn't actually have any kind of gravitas in the narrative it's all just a uh, a a vehicle to introduce Oko and get the curse off of Garrick and stuff like that. So I think you're right. Like yeah. it's all it's all well and good having cards, and that's great. That's obviously a very very good thing. But if then narratively there's no sort of follow through, there's no fa uh, there's no um, uh, building off of that. It's at the end of the day, it's just a piece of cardboard. Yeah, and so I think it's like really hard to sort of explain why representation matters if you don't ever have to think about it. Mm. And that's kind of like my challenge to you, the random commenter today, who's about to, you know, write me a paragraph about why is representation prop, uh, you know, an issue. It's just a fucking card game. Mm. I would like to ask you in the media that you watch or read or consume the characters that you identify with, what do they, why do you identify with them and what do they look like? Mm. And Random commenter, don't tell me there's no character you identify with in anything you consume because that's just bullshit. <laughs> because then you don't, then then you're not actually interested in the media, yeah. right? Like if like I'm really into the Final Fantasy XIV lore, like I've been getting really deep into it outside of just playing the game, and like I I see a lot of I I fucking love Thancred and I, I I love Asinian, and even though they're not black, I love these characters because. Asinian is this fucking badass Lancer guy, but is literally dumb as shit in a himbo. <laughs> like, they give him money to, like, buy potions to, like, take care of, like, this, like, teleportation sickness that they have. And my dude almost spends all of it on, like, one potion. Like, their whole, like, fucking travel money, they're like, he's like, yeah, I'm gonna spend, like, he gets swindled. And when they ask him, like, where'd all the money go? He's like, oh, I spent it on the three potions. They're like... That, that was a lot of money, my guy. <laughs> and then Thancred is just mad mad daddy vibes. But, like, I, I, like, why am I engaged in the story? Because I connect with two characters. If I wasn't, if I couldn't connect with any characters, I would not be engaged in the story. Right? Why was I super into an invasion story? Because Teferi basically, like, I'm reading the novel. It's, like, one of the first novels, magic novels I read. And Urza goes up to Teferi and he's like, all right, the Phyrexians, they're coming. We, this is it's a now or never time to like go to war with them we we need the mana rigs we need the military might of zalfir and teferi goes nah fam you suck you almost blew up the entire plane um you were fucking awful to me in school i'm dumb of your white people nonsense goodbye and like snaps zalfir into a time bubble and it's like peace deuces and i was like hold on did, did, did Teferi just, just, just nope an entire country out of existence? Yo, I, I guess we're fucked in the war, and we essentially were. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we barely won the first Phyrexian war. Yeah. We're, we're probably, it's not looking good right now in the current story. 
Um, I am going to... And oh, look who has to, like, save the day, Teferi. Teferi's back. Weird that it comes full circle. Um, he is, li he is like, the entire... It's like, that. I can't remember what the name of the, like, the comic cast or whatever. I think XCTC or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's like this whole complicated stack of boxes being, like, held up by this one single square that if that goes, the entire thing crumbles down. That square is absolutely Teferi. If Teferi goes, the entire multiverse is fucked. Well, it's really funny because, like, Urza's plan really did hint on Sulfur being there. And Teferi's just like, uh, yes, because the mana rigs, which makes, like, all of the weaponry and stuff, is on Jamora and, and, uh, what is it, Shivan? And so when Teferi, so when Teferi like blinks Sulfur out, the description in the book, which I think I like have on one of my desks in my office, uh, is that like some of the man mana rig factories are like in half because they were like on the Sulfur border. Cause like Teferi's like, I'm just gonna like, we don't want to be a part. I don't want to be a part of this war. I'm not about it. I'm just gonna like phase us out. And, and Urza's like, but like the mana rigs, they're mine. And he's like, yeah, you can have the mana rigs that are like not in Zulfir. And so, like, there is, like, a sentence description of, like, half of mana rigs that were, like, on, like, the border of Zalfir. Man, that's badass. That's so cool. Right? Also, I need to I need to petition uh, the Brothers War to be renamed as a set White People Nonsense. <laughs> I mean, that's how I, re that's how I reread it as an adult. As a kid, I was just like, yo, are we fucking doomed? Did we just, we just lost Wakanda. Shit. We, we doomed. But yeah. Teferi was supposed to be one of the nine titans to go to to go to Phyrexia. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the way that we Urza had like a three prong plan for fighting the Phyrexians: the legacy weapon, which involves Karn, the mothership, uh, the Weatherlight, a bunch of artifacts, and Gerard, who's part of the legacy bloodline. Uh, that's part one. Uh, the Methran uh, army, which is these like uh, super soldiers that. Urza, like, bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Nine Titans, which were supposed to be Tefer which was supposed to be Teferi, Urza, and a bunch of other planeswalkers going to Phyrexia in essentially mech suits? Yes. They needed the mech suits to be able to, like, make their way through everything, because even though planeswalkers are, like, all-powerful, Phyrexia is supposed to be, like, kind of... Yeah. No like, makes it very difficult to be a planeswalker. Mm -hmm. And then, like, blow up Phyrexia. Cool. Mm -hmm. Lit. Teferi, like, put a huge wedge in that plan by taking away the, like, weapons manufacturing, one of the key military mites of Dominaria, and then also not going on the, the mech suit suicide mission. Peace! Because, by the way, like, most of the planeswalkers don't survive no. the, the, the Phyrexian, uh... Mission. That's the um. That's the mission that Urza uses Tevish Zat as a literal like battery. And everyone's like, "You fucking suck." Mm. And the answer is yes, he fucking sucks. Urza sucks. What? Nah, seems fake. Nah. I I do. Yeah. I know this isn't how it turned out in the law, and I also don't want to get too derailed and like talk about how like yeah. about this section particularly because I do want to ask a couple of extra things. But I do love the idea of like. Teferi leaves and there's a slot open for the Nine Titans and Urza's like, oh, I put I put Tevish in reserves. I didn't think I'd need to bring him. And they're like, he's like, he's like, I guess I can use him as a living bomb. <laughs> Literally, right? We've talked a lot about how things were in magic, how things are in magic, but what's some things that you'd like to see like magic going forward? And we've touched on a few things. Like I can just think of a couple of things off the top of my head of like, you know, bringing back a couple of, like, the uh, actual Black Planeswalkers into being more involved in the narrative and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, like, I think one of the things that I definitely want is, and this is really selfish, I, I want one of two things. Either take me to a plane that is black, mm -hmm. right? Take me to Jamora the plane. Like, literally just, it's it's predominantly black, it's very ethnocentric, it's, like, African culture. Uh, like, give me that. Like, I would love that. We got that. We got that for Kamigawa. We got that kind of for Ixalan, but not great because Conquistadors, but, you know, that's for another conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we get that for Theros. Amonkhet was kind of very disappointing when it comes to that. Uh, I would love to see a set that's just, like, deeply staked in blackness. Um, short of that, I would love to have our Avengers Endgame moment where Wakanda, where, I mean, Salfir comes back. <laughs> And uh, 
that's part of the reason we win uh, Phyrexian War to Electric Boogaloo. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause like, again, a lot of fucked up shit keeps happening on Dominaria that basically keeps set setting civilization back. And Zalfir is still Zalfir. So like if Zalfir, if Zalfir like just gets phased back into existence, it's still gonna have all of its military, all of its technology, all of its magic. Huh. And if they come back in and they're like, well, shit's on fire, I guess we have to fix that. Um, I hadn't even thought, you're right. Like, cause yeah, cause they've been completely divorced from all of the fucking bullshit, the white people nonsense that's been going on in Dominaria. They didn't have to deal with the Phyrexian war. They didn't have to deal with the stuff going with the, with the Mirari. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to deal with the mending. Nope. So like, we could also potentially have uh, sparked planeswalkers that are pre-mending. Oh! In here. Ooh! Ooh, now we that- We could do some spicy, we could do some spicy shit. I mean like, even like even if we look at like the scale of like some of the legendary creatures, like mages that we have post-mending that aren't planeswalkers, mm. they're definitely not nearly as powerful as some of the mages that we see in the magic story. No. But like Zalfir has been divorced from that sort of concept, and I think it'd be really interesting to see how Watsi ever handles bringing Zalfir back. Mm. Because there's, like, do you just nerf Zalfir? Do you just, like, pretend that, like, it wasn't a magically, like, powerful nation? Mm. Like, I just think it would be really cool to see it. Um, yeah. And then it would be cool to see, like, now that, like, pl planes seem to be way more interconnected now, man, I would love to see Zalfir interact with some of the more technologically advanced, like, Com like current Kamigawa, mm. Kaladesh, when we were considered the technologically advanced civilization on on uh, Dominaria. Mm. Like, I just think there's a lot of really cool things that could be happening mm. with Zalfir coming back. This is my headcanon. I would love to see that. Um, give me a set that takes place if you, or if we're not going to do Zalf if we're not going to do the cool Wakanda moment with Zalfir, just take us back to Jamara. Go back to like the classic way that you used to tell stories on Dominaria, where they were hyper focused on a specific region. There's still a whole desert. There's still a bunch of other, uh, I guess they're like city states mm. on Jamar that are still there. It's not like Teferi blinked out all of civilization on Jamar. Yeah. He just blinked Zalfir out. Mm. Um, so that would be really cool. Um, I I want to see, as much as I love Teferi and I love uh, Kaya, I think they fit very heavily into two types of black stereotypes. Sort of the the black girl magic, uh, like, you know, badass bitch. Uh, is kind of the thing that Kaya fits into. Uh, and then Teferi is very much the mystical Negro that, like, kind of everybody has to go to to save the day or get sage advice and whatnot. Like, that's his role in the Gatewatch, right? Mm. They find him, and he's supposed to, like, he turns the tide. And I love that for him, and I love that he gets to have this redemption arc because Teferi was also kind of an asshole back, back in the day, too. Oh, I didn't know. I mean, he's, like, very selfish. A lot of the Planeswalkers are because, like, they're very divorced from reality yeah. because they're immortal uh, and all-powerful. Uh, so, like, a lot of the Planeswalkers aren't particularly great, even if they're good guys. Mm. Um, but I would love to see... I would love to, like, explore a, a different type of, of blackness. Mm. Uh, I think that, like, I'm a little bored of Teferi and Kaya. Um, I would love to see Amamantu. Uh, especially because, like, a lot of the art that's, like, not story art involves, like, Liliana and Amamantu. Mm. So I'd love to see, like, if that's, like, an actual relationship. Like, does is she someone that mentors? Did Amamantu go to Strixhaven? Like, I don't know a lot about Amamantu. I don't think she has a lot of lore. No, no, she really does not. So, like, I would love to, like, learn about Amamantu. I would love to see, you know, just more black. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to, like, story-wise, that I would love to just, like, have a set that's sort of divorced from the Gatewatch. Um, I just, that's kind of like a big thing that I feel about Magic Story in general. And I understand that like, that's probably not gonna happen because like the Gatewatch is sort of the way that we move around. Mm. But like we beat Nicol Bolas and like hopefully after we're done with the Brothers War, we can just have some story. Yeah. We, and I know that there's never really been a time in Magic where like conflict or uh, overarching conflict didn't drive the story. It would be nice to have some more one shottiness mm. um, similar to like Ice Age or like Homelands where it's like, you know, very like snapshotty. Mm. I guess like when a lot of people ask me, like, what do I want to see? I I feel pretty good about where like the modern magic story is going. Mm. 
Uh, and like I said, I, I love that, like, I can look at a magic card and just see black people in it. And it doesn't have to be, like, a legendary creature. It doesn't have to be because, like, we're in the jungle. I love the angels the with Myriad from uh, Baldur's Gate 2. I think that card's sick. And the yeah. fact that the alt art is just three black men angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. Think it's the coolest thing fucking ever. And I just, like, love that. Like, the halfling... Like, does it that, like, if your opponent searches your library, you, like, draw a card. That car that the art on that looks kind of, like, not white, looks kind of brownish. Here for that, too. I love that, like, I can just look at magic cards and just see black people just randomly on them all the time. I'm not saying every single card, but, like, it's not hard. I don't have to, like, try. Yeah. I think I told you the story, and I, I haven't said this on any other show. Uh, there was, like, a very long period of time where I just, like, couldn't ever see a black person on a magic card. Like I would just like look and be like, nope, white dude, white dude, white dude, white dude. And there's a card called Gravel Slinger and it's pretty bad. It's like a four mana two, two that can like tap to deal one damage. Uh, but there's, it's a black guy and he's got like dreads and he looks really badass, you know, spinning his slingshot. And I put that card in decks literally because he was black, mm. knowing that it was a bad mm. card. I was just like, this guy's black. I don't really like playing white. But he's on a white card and he's black. He's going in my deck. I'm going to I'm gonna force white into my deck so I can play this guy. Uh, and I don't have to do that anymore. If I want to have black people on magic cards, I can. Um, just like, you know, I, 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 I've said this on Twitter. I only build decks. I only build commander decks now of POC or women commanders. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, like, work really hard to do that mm -hmm. either. Um, so, like, as far as, like, magic art and design goes, it's, like, go trending in the direction that I want. Now I just want the story to sort of catch up with Hell that. Yeah. I want to see more than just Teferi and Kaya. And this is a complaint I have in general. I'm bored of the Gatewatch. Give me Amamantu. I wish that Zimone was more important to the Strixhaven yes. story. They're like, oh, Zimone, Qu Quandrix Prodigy. Let's throw her on like pretty much every Quandix card. But fuck her. She doesn't really matter to the no, story. It's all about uh, Professor Onyx and again, the fucking Kenrith twins Twi fucking around <laughs> in life. Those bastards! I hate them! <laughs> but I was like really disappointed. I got very excited when I saw this young black girl mm. who's supposed to be like the smartest fucking Quandrick student. She's got natural hair, right? It's not like Kaya where it's like, you know, in, in a mohawk or in dreads. It's just, she's just rocking her natural hair 100%. And I was like so fucking hyped. Mm. And then I, I was like, all right, I'm gonna read the Strixhaven story because here, like, even though she's an uncommon legendary, which probably means she's like not super important to the story, I was like hoping she would matter somewhat, and she like doesn't. And I'm I was I was just very sad. Mm. Um, so give me some blackness and give me more blackness in the story. Uh, would be my like first big ask. Brilliant. I do have one other point that I'd like to bring up about blackness and magic. We sort of lightly touched mm. on it. And, you know, you had asked the question of, you know, is there ever a point where, like, representation politics, like, uh, kind of doesn't do the job? Or, you know, is there something as, like, too much representation? And to which, you know, and I, like, again, because we had these type of comments in the, um, uh, in the last video that we did, which was about representation, mm. I think something to say because you know is there a limit to the rep to like what representation can achieve and the answer is yes right you're never going to be able to make everyone feel seen because we're all multifaceted people it's going to be very challenging but i don't think that means that we shouldn't try i think one of the things that people don't kind of talk about when it comes to representation is that like it's not a zero it's not like a, a zero sum mm. game right it's not like either there's a, there's representation or there's no representation uh, it kind of has to be in the middle, right? Like, there's not a lot of, uh, differently abled characters in Magic, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we haven't hit that intersection very hard. I would love to see, and I, I, like, I know that a lot of people see themselves in, like, a lot of the more, uh, Ethereum-esque characters, like, to, like, uh, Tezzeret, because, mm -hmm. like, half of his body is Metalcraft. Um, so, like, but, like, that's not necessarily differently abled that's just esper mm. right so i would like to see more intentionally depicted differently abled people whether it's you know characters in you know professor x style uh wheelchairs or even just traditional wheelchairs mm. you know people with prosthetics 
Uh, it's kind of weird that, like, Magic doesn't have a lot of characters with prosthetics that, like, aren't Phyrexian. Hmm. Hmm. Or Ethereum, yeah. right? Like, it's a lot of, it's a lot of people that are, that don't necessarily have prosthetics because, like, as far as lore goes, that don't necessarily have prosthetics because, like, injury, it's like, oh, mechanical arm better than real yeah. arm. It's sort of more transhumanism as opposed to, uh, yeah. yeah, a good representation for, yeah. So, like... So when it comes to, when we're talking broadly now about representation, we're not just talking about, like, blackness and magic. Um, I think that I would like to see us just be wild about it. I think WotC is doing a better job in D&D right now. Mm. Um, well, I mean, and I know the D&D community can speak a bit more, and I know that's still not perfect over there, too. But it, it seems it seems that they're they're trying to do more broad diversity like they're trying to fix how they uh you know i know that they they i i think because D, &D is something that you can make homebrews for yeah. uh a lot of times you can kind of just fix it in your own way so like if you're like like there's a person who made the magical item for a wheelchair for the dean for like the dnd &D rule hmm. set that's really cool uh and you kind of can do that you kind of can't do that with magic you kind of just i know that like proxy all art artists exist and you know you had a really great video with megan about that good old sheep wave um but yeah I, I don't think there's a limit i think there is a limit that you can have when it comes to uh achieving what you want with representation but it's not a limit because you can't represent because you can't do it mm. it's a limit because you can't you don't you don't know an identity until you experience mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. right so like i didn't know until watching that video that there are people that identify with ashiok mm. right they're like yo or the Aetherborn, right? There were some comments that was... There was definitely one or two comments that was like, I know that it's not everyone who's non-binary identifies with being, you know, post-human, but I view my non-binary experience as post-human. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? That's fair. That's that's a, that's That wasn't what I was trying to erase, but I see what you're saying. Cool, right? I just didn't think of that experience. Mm -hmm. The limitations of representation is, is basically reflected by the limitations of the knowledge of the people who make the story and make the art. Uh, have and so the way that we fix that is by just having more and more black artists more queer artists more differently abled artists more more you know creative uh more diverse art directors mm. all of these things help to bridge that limitation mm. uh and so i uh you know even though i don't know how well we did on just like talking about blackness and magic i think i did a pretty good job but i think in this sort of like spearhead of I keep coming on in the representation episodes. Uh, I think when we talk about representation, we have to understand that like there's only a limited amount of stuff that we can do uh, with the with the tools that we have at, at hand, right? Mm -hmm. So like I am half black and I have some experiences because I'm half black. Uh, whereas like maybe if Spike had uh, Spice had, I don't know, um, Black Girl Mage on or uh, Princess Weeks, mm -hmm. right? then like they're going to have a different take on blackness and magic mm. right because they're we're different um and that's something i want everyone to keep in mind just like with the trans episode you know i have a lot of different takes than other trans people yeah. have and that's just not not because i'm like wildly different or i'm you know super spicy compared to other trans people i just have a different trans experience and i do and i have a different lens and so when it comes to representation you have to understand that like lens is important absolutely um, and the next time you will be on uh, the Spice 8 Rack channel, it won't be for a representation episode. It will be to grill you about your ludicrous uh, policy of uh, endorsing more power given to the Simic color combination. I just... It's because it's because you know what? We have to make up for the fact that like goblins suck so much. And that's the end that... of the fucking episode. I hope you learned some <laughs> shit. Um, thank you so much, Amanda, for coming on. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. You can find Amanda at all of these different places that are currently on screen. Social medias, uh, articles. I'll have it all linked in the description as well if you want to go check that out. Uh, is there anything you want to plug just before uh, the video ends, Amanda? No, uh, just be awesome to each other. And this time in the comments... Don't tell me I'm wrong, because I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> I know a lot more than you do. Mm-hmm. Damn right. Uh, uh, you can tell me that I'm wrong, though. I'm a fucking idiot. And on that note, it's time to end the show. And uh, a big thank you to all of my patrons who make videos like this possible. 
some of the ten dollar patrons include one, two, three, four, I declare a class war. A filthy communist bunny, a fool of five colours, a gay American couple, a metric ton of bees, a pangolin-shaped servo, a screaming Batman, a waste of a perfectly good skeleton, Akumi the Reaper, Adam Gable, Adam Gunderman, Adam Ross Henry, Aesthetic Dialectic, AJ Ingram, Alesha Karnin, Alex Berman, Alex from Adelaide, Aglai D. Sisway, in parentheses Barry, Alice Perales, Ali, an alt-right sleeper agent who gives money to communists Bika Eidica, and then in parentheses probably tilts for Sona, I draw penises on pastries, an entire council of ghosts, an exhausted capybara, an Umbreon pastry, Andrew Elf, Anne Morgana, anonymous anarchist, Aqua Regia, Asmorado Mardica Dystina Kuldaklar's cooking blog, Austin L, Bacchus98, Basu Gasu Baku Hatsu Baku Matsu, Ben Pike, Ben Zimmet, Benji Skag Boat Esquire the Fourth, Bitter Cup of Joe, Blake Evers, Bobby, Brian B, Brian Dunn, Brian Rodham, but you can call me Thrakazod, Caleb Walton, Kalu, Charon Barboza, Charles Cohen, Chloe, Crow Me, Chris DeVos, Chris Kitsuni Campbell, Cognitive Glitch, Commy Mommy, Crockist, Curtis Paul Fleming, Darius Rudeminer, Dark Jin, Darth Pink Hippo, Deadpan Goth, Dean Pioquidio, Duncan Lindsay, Edward Gordon, Effie Eldon, Exidian, Eric Lindell, Erin Slaba, Etienne Champion Masson, Everyone Loves Robots, Fraxel, Felix Mortem, Fiona, Fofa, Foxy Dean, Future Beagle, Gab Larod, Judge of Jank, Georges Andressen, Georgian Tom, Grand Regent Pi, Grey Days, Guilty Sonder, Have You Considered Human Rights Maybe, Homosexual Bird That Steals Shiny Things, How To PNP, Hooper Dup, Hypercube MTG, I'm abusing my powers to make Spice 8 Rack say silly things like this here, I am saying this only because our global economic system does not intrinsically support artistic expression, I just made you say never wear Boris, I want Emrakul to dominate me, I'm not dead, I just ran out of jokes, Imbecilicus Rex, in response I bolt myself, in response table flip, Jack Bland, Jack the Mindfucker, Jackson Seamayer, Jackson West, Jacob Williams, Jake Colburn, Jake the Scrumptious Little Crumpet, JC Kairos, Jennifer Klein, Jess Will Eat the Delicious Cards Yum Yum, Johnny Rifle, Josh, Joshua M. Stephan, Julie Bunn, Julius Holm, June Violet Ano, June Duty Bound, Just Mild Lilac, Kalia Whithart, K. Santum, Ku Zombie, Quasi Quarterings Driving School, Voted Best School for Learning U-Turns 2022. Jesus, it's taken me so long to make this video that by the time that I'm reading the credits, this is no longer a relevant political joke. That's fucking amazing. Oh, fuck the Tories. Anyway, Kyle Denley, Lee Barbs, Lily Sappho, yes, I gave myself two names that just mean lesbian, Lonis Crypto Marxologist, Linnea, Madame Monroe, Magic Fellow, Marcellius Brown, Mario Romero, Matthew Miles, Matthew Butler, Matthew Short, Max Makes Magic, Meow Serita, Metal Gamer 21, Midi Bat, Michale Hamada, Molly Felon, Moose, Nathan Speepisman Harris, N. Ben, Nicholas Avery, Nicola Prisic, No, No Gods, No Double Masters, brilliant, Nom 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 Nom, Yoshi, Ogrok and Ogrok Jr., Omar Al Tabahi, One Single Mungus, pronounced like Mungus, like in Humongous, feel free to read this part out as well, Onion Knight Val, Oops or Signy, Pappy Markov was a mistake, Patty Fism, Peter Carter, Phil Gamesh, Phoenix Swans, Procrastitron 3000, Punished Venom Scalene, Quasu, Reblack, Replicase, Robson Yukon, Ross Conklin, Ryan Gomez, Sam Cook, Scrimblo Bimblo the Lovable Scronko, Sentient Simic Value Engine with no real wincon, several goblins in a trench coat, Sean, Shifty H, Skolaton, Sky Johnson, Sorry Zia, Space Josu, Stephen Christopher, Steve Grill, Stink Stifle Soria, Strange Friend, Swan Hunter, Tamio's new Phyrexian orphanage, damn. Tanner, the big sexy dentist, Taylor Street, Thar's refined grizzly, the A positive blood type goddess of death, the horny crab goddess, the jelly bean warlock, the pultism, the farm Cyrus, 
Thelon, the one who plays, the Reaper of You, Thomas Quinlan, Thomas Saint, the Boris are all bootlickers or pigs and nobody can tell me otherwise, totally a spy, aka he who simps for Emrakul, hashtag free her, Travis K, Undead Herbs, Vats3, Whopper, Wasson Ann, Watcher9132, well, well, you asked for it, Wesley, that rat bastard communist, when I close my eyes, Niall Sylvan is there watching, waiting, smiling, Whirlwind Abyss, Wicked Haiku, William Cox, William Lyndon Smith, Yabu, Yuki Akama, and Xanaron. And a massive thank you to all of my other lovely patrons. Um, a massive thank you again to Amanda for uh, coming on the channel and having this conversation with me. And I'll see you all next time. And as always, stay spicy.